Good morning, everybody. My name is Catherine Fishkoff, and along with Lydia Dugdill, we are two members of a five-person ethics consultation service here at Columbia. Um, and we had a pretty overwhelming, um, as, as others did, um, we had a pretty overwhelming spring and thought it would be worthwhile to pull our experience together into a co cohesive picture and try to see what we might be able to learn from our experience um, and apply into the future. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. I know it's a little bit different than um, maybe some of the other presentations, but hopefully um, people will find it interesting. So um, just a little bit of background. Normally, at uh, so so we cover two hospitals. Our our ethics consult service we cover Milstein and the Allen Pavilion, um, and so just to give you a little bit of a of a sense of what it was like here in the spring. Normally, we have 117 ICU beds at Milstein, and at the very peak of our surge, we were up to about 300 beds, um, and that those beds opened over the course of only a matter of weeks. Um, it came from converting operating rooms, from converting the cath lab, um, from converting floor beds, um, you know, that were normally rooms on, on the normal inpatient wards. Um, we were able to very rapidly ramp up our ICU bed um, capacity. At the Allen, normally there are 12 beds, but at the peak there were over 30 beds. Um, I should add, some of those beds also came um, we had pop-up, what we called pop-up ICUs um, in the emergency room as well. But it wasn't just about beds. Um, we also had um, capacity issues with dialysis, for example. Normally we have about, we can support about 15 patients at any given time on, on continuous dialysis. But because of the incredible um, intensity of disease among COVID patients, at our peak, we had about 60 patients who required continuous dialysis at any time. Um, in order to staff the beds that we created, we had to impose on nursing and increase their ratios. So normally a nurse in the ICU has one or two patients at any given time, but at the peak, there were nurses carrying four patients uh, at a time. And as I mentioned, as part of um, as part of increasing our ICU capacity, we converted a lot of spaces, uh, including the operating room. Normally, we have 32 operating rooms here at Milstein, and all but three were converted into ICU beds, um, leaving not very many rooms available for uh, elective operations or emergency operations. But um, as you may remember, all elective operations were on hold. And even things that we normally treated with surgery, um, such as appendicitis or cholecystitis, um, these were all being treated with antibiotics to try to preserve the rooms that we had for true emergencies. So that just kind of gives you a sense of what it was like here at the time. Um, and just in the same way that that there was um, an, um, a strain on capacity for clinical services, there was also a strain on the um, on the ethics service. So what what we did in this paper, uh, we compared, which is out now in the Journal of Clinical Ethics, um, if anybody wants to read the full paper. Um, but we compared our experience from March 16th to May 10th here this year to the same time period last year to try to get a sense of the burden on the ethics service. Because as you can imagine, there was, there was a lot of issues um, that came up during this period. Normally, it, or in that same period from last year, we had 25 consults. And in, in the COVID surge um, eight week period, we had nearly 100 consults. So it was a fourfold increase in the number of calls that we got. Um, and in that surge, um, over 80% of them of the calls that we got were related to COVID patients, which reflected the, the hospital census, which was also nearly 80% of patients in the hospital were COVID patients. So this is just a, um, a demographic slide to show you um, sort of the comparison from last year to this year. Um, really, the only thing that stood out to us was the difference um, in Hispanic and Latino patients. So um, the, the number, the, the percentage of Hispanic patients that we got consulted on this year was far exceeded the number that we had last year. And, and we suspect that some of this is because during the COVID surge, um, Colombia served its community. And as you know, our community is, is widely a, a Hispanic and Latino com uh, community. And so, the, while I don't have the numbers of the um, census at any given time 
um, of the demographics of our of our hospital, um, we we had a, a huge number of community patients here, and a lot of those were Hispanic and Latino patients. So I suspect that that explains the difference from last year to this year. That it was just the not that there were more ethical issues among Hispanic and Latino patients, but that they represented a greater proportion of the hospital patients at the time. Um, the other thing that was interesting is that um, compared to this time last year, there were fewer patients who had advanced directives on admission. Um, and our hypothesis for this is that COVID affected young people, um, put them in the ICU and at, you know, at, at risk of life-threatening illness at much higher rates than before COVID affected young people and it spread quickly and it worsened quickly. And so um, this was a population of people who often don't have advanced directives. Um, and it showed <clears throat> during this time period um, that people hadn't you know, hadn't produced advanced directions in advance. Um, the other thing that was sort of obvious is that the location of consults that we got for our ethics consults were primarily in the ICU because so many of the consults we got were around end of life issues. Um, so that normally our ethics consults are spread through the hospital on the floor in the ICU, um, but they were really concentrated during the COVID surge in the ICU. And this is really just a site that sort of shares the meat of what we did during those, those few months. The, we classified our consults for the primary reason for consult, um, and we broke it down into essentially four categories. One was care at the end of life, um, and this was really, these were questions about um, goals of care, uh, and particularly futility, which of course is a uh, was a big topic of conversation for us um, during the COVID surge. The con the conflict category would be um, uh, conflict between the the care team and the family, um, between sometimes between the care team and other services in the hospital, and often what we saw was conflict or what we'll get consults for is conflict between the care team um, and family members, I'm sorry I said, and then also between family members themselves. Um, and so, so that's the conflict category. The capacity and treatment over objection category is obviously patients who lack capacity, who need uh, some sort of an intervention. Um, that's another common consult that we get. And finally, the miscellaneous category, which includes things like administrative consent for procedures, identification of a surrogate, um, assistant with discharge planning, that kind of thing. So anyway, so if you look at 2019 compared to 2020, um, in 2019, we get sort of a smattering of consults across the board. But in 2020, the overwhelming majority of consults that we received were over questions about care at the end of life in COVID patients, um, as well as conflict almost always in, in these couple of months between the care team and, um, and family members. And finally, this is just sort of a cascade um, of, of the reasons for consult, because as you can imagine, they often overlap, right? Goals of care and futility and conflict. Um, it's hard sometimes to delineate the one reason for consult. So this is just sort of a cascade to show you um, what the questions were about um, in general um, and not limiting it to just one. So again, in our during our, our peak COVID surge, um, the majority of consults that we got were regarding goals of care, futility, a conflict, um, um, whether we could make patients DNR, DNI um, over objection, that kind of thing. So this is just sort of an overview of, um, of the consults. This is the data that we gathered. And, and I'm going to hand it over to Lydia to talk about the lessons that we learned and then happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Catherine. So um, Catherine's given you a lot of the overview. And what I'm going to do is just sort of hammer home a few points. Uh, as she described, we massively increased our capacity, uh, both as a hospital providing the ICU beds necessary to care for the COVID patients, but also in terms of clinical ethics. And uh, it's not customary for us to do so many consults, uh, but we were available around the clock and um, 
but we could not, and I think this is the important point here, we could not have met the need that uh, was there, because, especially because of the for addressing end-of-life issues without uh, the efforts of palliative care. And so in our paper, we actually cite a paper that has been published by our own palliative care service under the directorship of uh, Dr. Craig Blinderman. And for those of you who aren't aware, palliative care retrained a number of geriatricians as well as psychiatric residents and medical students and deployed teams to go out into the emergency room as well as to telephone patients who were already enrolled in palliative care clinics and um, I believe in some oncology clinics. And what they would do then is over the telephone or in the emergency room while the patients were still, uh, still had mental capacity, they had goals of care conversations with them. And this helped to mitigate a lot of the stress on teams that were then subsequently caring for these very sick patients uh, and, and didn't have advanced directives as Catherine indicated. So uh, the second bullet here, we need advanced care planning. Uh, the data we, we collected show that only about 11% of our patients during the COVID era came in with advanced directives. And we know that nationally, uh, in sort of normal times, about 35 to 37% of patients have advanced directives, of, of US citizens have advanced directives. And, uh, and as you saw in the data in 2019, about 40% of our patients for whom we were consulted did have advanced directives. So that's consistent with the national data. But here during COVID, it was 11%. And uh, just to highlight uh, quickly that uh, racial and ethnic disparities with regard to advanced care planning is an ongoing issue. So uh, the vast majority of our consults were uh, for Hispanic and Latina patients in 2020 during the COVID surge. Uh, we know that Hispanic patients tend, only about 11% tend to have advanced directives and for our African-American patients, only about 15%. So the fact that we had a disproportionately high um, number of consults for minority patients, as well as um, keeping with the data uh, nationally that, that those communities tend to have lower rates of advanced uh, directives. It's very consistent, but it does underscore the need that if we are facing um, the possibility of a second wave in the fall or winter, uh, anybody who cares for patients needs to be addressing this with their patients. And palliative care, of course, is continuing to lead that charge, but it really is, a, is a, a responsibility for all practicing clinicians. Um, the third bullet we, we've discussed at length, um, not only with regard to advanced care planning, but certainly with uh, regard to disease manifestations. And um, the fact that so many of our consults were for patients from the community, I think also it's the shift that in times of crisis, people tend to go to their local hospital, right? There's far fewer transfers across the country, you know, fewer people coming from further afield to, to come to Columbia Presbyterian. Uh, instead, uh, we were caring for people from the neighborhood and, and, and that was reflected in our data. Uh, there was a lot of work between ethics, a lot of work between ethics and hospital leadership with regard to crafting policies. Uh, some of you may have read that uh, NYU's uh, emergency room at one point had declared that they did not have to attempt resuscitation CPR on patients who came into the emergency room with COVID. We, we never- um, Just giving you two minutes, but- Great, thank you. We never, uh, we never, in, um, enacted such policies here, but we were in very close conversation with hospital leadership on all variations of, of um, you, know, you know, crisis standards of care um, and variations on how we might treat patients. One of the uh, biggest issues with regard to CPR is the possibility of aerosolization during the CPR process. And so a question that came to ethics continually was, do I have to resuscitate this patient in front of me if my team is going to have increased risk of exposure and we already know the patient is dying? And so uh, while we did not um, go to that extent in this hospital, we wanted to ensure that our patients knew we would do everything possible for them. There were issues like this, uh, how to handle the allocation questions that were continually before ethics and hospital leadership. Um, and uh, and I, I think that probably the take home in our last minute here is the need for end of life 
uh, goals of care, advanced care planning uh, across, across communities. So this isn't just a hospital issue, but it's an issue for, for all of us. And there's been some conversation about whether we push to have a, you know, a national day to do this, and some hospitals and communities have pushed for this, uh, but a way to rule out uh, conversations on advanced care planning and goals of care in advance of end of life and in advance of a second wave uh, is vitally important. So uh, Catherine and I are happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, this was a very uh, intriguing presentation. Um, any question, please uh, uh, post them, uh, raise your hands, and I will uh, give you um, access. Let's see. I don't see any <clears throat> raise hands. So maybe, maybe I, I can ask one uh, while we're waiting for other people to chime in. Um, so obviously the, the care of the disease has evolved quite dramatically from the early days. And so how have these concerns, these ethical concern evolved? You know, and I think in the early days, for instance, the major issue was also who should receive uh, intubation uh, versus, versus not. You know, I think nowadays it's probably less of an issue. Um, but have you seen a significant evolution of the sort of ethical concerns surrounding the treatment of the illness? So um, one of the things that our, um, our leader, Dr. Ken Prager, always says is that ethics flow from the facts. And one of the things that was extremely challenging during the ethics surge or the COVID surge was um, that there just wasn't a lot of data to guide us. Um, but to answer your question specifically, we also had to rely on state law. And in New York State, we are not allowed to withhold resuscitation or intubation without permission from the patient or, this, or the patient's surrogate. Um, so- uh, But what if you don't have enough uh, machinery? So that's a very good question. And luckily for us, that never actually happened. We were able to continue to expand and expand. Um, and if, if I don't know if people saw um, that we participated or we were in an um, published and an, um, a, a trial of dual ventilation, for example. So very early during COVID, we were concerned that we might run out of ventilators. And we trialed putting two patients um, on one ventilator, for example. So we um, had created um, some guidelines for triaging critical resources um, should the need arise, arise, and they were in line with previously designed New York State allocation guidelines. Um, but because of our ability to continue to expand and expand and, and use the resources that we had creatively, we never actually had to. Um, and again, you know, what, what one might think is ethical may or may not be legal as well. So we're constrained. Right. Um, I see that. So I, I'm, I don't seem to be able to allow people to, to talk. Um, Jess, did you know uh, what's different? Uh, oh, uh, I think maybe you're not co-host, but I can do it. Oh, okay. Let me. I'll allow Rita. I'm gonna allow. So I see Rita, Rita and Janine Darmiento have questions. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you, Catherine and um, Catherine and Lydia. Thank you very much. A question for the rest of us, I mean, the ordinary general internists and general surgeons and all the rest of us, is how much are you all been able to educate the ordinary doctors, nurses, social workers? I know it's uphill. I know people like Joita have been working with the medicine residents, but is this a priority for you? Question for, well, I guess we're the only one who can talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Rita, thank you. Yeah, you know, one of the really, one of the things that was very interesting during COVID was the ability to rapidly share policies um, and get the message out to different groups. And that was during a crisis, there was a lot of information sharing and it was very difficult for anybody to focus on any one thing. Um, I think, Subsequently, it's very important, as Lydia was saying, for people to have these conversations um, about end of life care, about how to um, prepare should another surge come. Um, mm -hmm. And 
you know, the palliative care team has been essential in that. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know what the outpatient um, community has, you know, the, the outpatient medicine community has taken up, but I think this is all a very important part of preparing for the next surge. One last question from Janine. So my question is this, um, during the crisis, I, it's, it's the past and it was, it was something unique, but I think about the ethics of having increased, um, you know, nursing ratios and how, the, and the care of the people that we, we were, were looking after in terms of, you know, you said we all, they all were able to get ventilators and everybody was able to get care, but the care we all can agree was not um, optimal. And I wonder whether, um, we need to address the law before we have the next situation. Because um, if you look at the mortality rate of the New York hospitals during the surge, things were, were not so great. Um, and, I, and I wonder if there's conversations about the ethics of actually what we did and the way we did it. Yeah, so we worked very, very closely with Governor Cuomo, um, various members of ethics across Columbia and Cornell, uh, really, pushed hard to have some legal protections. And we did end up, um, the governor did end up signing a, uh, was an, it was an executive order, I believe, right, Catherine? Mm -hmm. That gave us immunity for care of COVID patients from something like March 1st, I think, or March 6th, um, through to, it recently ended. Uh, but the idea was that if in good faith, um, things happened, uh, because we weren't able to practice at the top, you know, you know, one-to-one -one nursing ratios, all of the things you just mentioned, Janine, that we would have uh, immunity. And uh, interestingly, there have been a number of uh, malpractice lawyers who have been trying to work to have that retroactively revoked, um, so that we dip, so that we lose that protection. But the governor hasn't taken that away. But I'll, I'll tell you that there was a lot of. It took a, a lot of effort to try to even get that in place. Uh, I think our state has uh, traditionally um, sided very, very strongly on a, it's a very strong patient's rights state, which is a wonderful thing, but it does um, on some level uh, hinder uh, the, the freedom of physicians to practice uh, in accordance with their judgments. So there's a tension there, but yes, working with the state was very much working with our hospital uh, legal counsel, hospital administration, as well as with the state to try to get protections for our physicians was, was a lot of what uh, the work of our team did. And I would add that if you followed the, um, the news throughout, you could tell that the public sentiment was not in favor of triaging resources. Um, so agree that, that um, there would need to be legislation to, to allow us to do things differently, but that the public would not be in favor of us triaging. And truth be told, um, we were all very proud that we were able to expand. And I think had we had to start triaging resources, the burden that that would have put on the caregivers would have been absolutely enormous. Um, so, so it's a very tricky and nuanced question.